today we're having two panels. Uh, the first one is a rather broad policy discussion of issues around senior mobility and, and transportation. Um, and the other is, is uh, made up of people who actually run some of the services, primarily. Um, each panel um, will have about 40 minutes, and so we're limiting uh, people's time, and, unless there's a, a great outcry about it, to four minutes each as they're, as they're a, a responding to questions and responding to other people on the panel if they wish to. Um, our, we will also pass out um, uh, cards to anybody in the audience who raises a hand and a little pencil so you can write questions, which <laughs> which Polly Amrine is passing out right now. She has her Raise hand, hand up there, and then she will collect them, and Helene Lacar will sort through them so that we don't have too many duplicates, and so that they may, you know, we can group those who fall into a, a pattern. Um, and we're here today to talk about the wants, the needs, and the preferences of seniors, and, and to discuss the fact that in this, um, by the end of this decade, the number of seniors in the Bay Area is, per, is forecast to be increased by 35%. In other words, we're going to become quite a, quite, a, quite a force in the Bay Area, all of us. You're going to be a tsunami. <laughs> a tsunami. Well, for the better. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's important that, uh, that we recognize this and that providers and funders and planners uh, take this into account when planning, uh, when planning transportation for the Bay Area. Um, I just want to say it is, of course, partly to, for, well, a great deal to benefit the, the seniors in this decade to enable them to get around. But I have to just tell you that when I became when I first retired, I was totally amazed to discover that, you know, this world would not be working as well as it is if it were not for retirees who volunteer their time from, for everything from political issues they work on, they, you know, sponsor candidates, they have forums, they, um, everything from politics to staffing the gift shops at hospitals, and we all know about all of the, the services that are voluntary. Um, many, I, right after I retired, I worked at a, a, at, a, at a crisis center for a while where all of the volunteers who saved lives on the telephone were volunteers and mainly seniors. So, so our community would not be as rich and as well functioning as it is if we simply said seniors should age in place and it doesn't matter if they get around or not. It really matters to our civic life that, that seniors get around. So that's my, my pitch for the day and now I'll be quiet because um, I want to introduce, introduce our first panel. Um, I'll in, first introduce Shannon Tracy, who's on my right. She's from Transform, the organization that we often uh, still think of as the Transportation and Land Use Coalition, a coalition of many groups in the Bay Area, environmental transportation and others, who are planning and advocating very strongly for sustainable transportation that serves everyone and, and that has goals for equity, environment, and the economy, which translates to sustainability, if you think about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Shannon has worked for nearly a decade in California as a community organist, organizer, organist. She is a cyclist, a swimmer, a roar, and a hiker who has never owned a car. It's amazing. Uh, now she uh, coordinates the Transformation, Transformation for America's partner organization in California, and you will, I guess, tell us a bit about what they have lately published and done. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Bonnie Nelson is on my left right here. She's a founding principal of Nelson Nygaard Cons uh, Consulting. She's managed a wide range of transportation projects, and all of us who have been working in this field know that. We have participated in projects for which she has been the facilitator, the moderator, and we know her probably best as a person who does actually manage to bring people together. She's handled some of the most difficult and uh, divisive uh, issues in the Bay Area with great success. Um, uh, she has um, also worked in, you know, de developed by uh, solutions for en enhancing urban mobility in many fronts, including things like parking pop. Uh, policy and mobility options. And I want to introduce Elizabeth Deacon. Deacon, known better as Betty Deacon to most of us, okay? <laughs> uh, she's a professor of city and regional planning and urban design at UC Berkeley. She's been the director of the UC Transportation Research Center. Uh, she is the author of well over 200 articles chapters and books, reports, etc. And heaven knows how often she's been a footnote in other people's <laughs> books, and chapters, and reports um, on everything ranging from environmental justice to transportation pricing. She's currently studying urban development and transportation in China, Latin America, and India. Um, I want to say that, in my view, one of her stellar accomplishments is that she was an early chair of the Berkeley Transportation Commission and set a really high standard for everybody who came after her. But we all at Berkeley remember her very fondly. Okay. So I'm thinking that some of us in the room need a really brief <coughs> bit of, including me, background information or, to, or a brush up on things that we already know because as you probably are aware, people who talk about transportation tend to throw around acronyms and pretty soon you're lost if you <laughs> haven't thought about it lately. So, um, um, Bonnie, uh, I think will uh, tell us a bit about the institutions that make the decisions for transportation in Alameda County. Thank you. I'd like to start us off by talking about a very unique opportunity that we have here in Alameda County. Uh, as many of you know, one of the primary funding sources for both transit and uh, paratransit that focuses on services for seniors and persons with disabilities is Measure B. Measure B is a half cent sales tax that's collected on everything that you buy in Alameda County and is allocated, distributed by uh, an organization which has recently changed names. It's the Alameda County Transportation Commission or Alameda CTC as they are known. Their job in part is to spend the half cent sales tax that's collected by Measure B. Uh, in Alameda County, about 10.5% of the money that's collected by sales tax goes to specialized services for seniors and persons with disabilities. That is the highest percentage of any county in California. And we're very proud of that. Measure B was voted on in 2002 and it will expire in 2022. Sounds like a long time, but Measure B has a problem. The problem is the recession. Since, we, since Measure B is sales tax, which is generated by the money you spend on things, when people aren't spending as much money on things, we're not generating as much in sales tax. In fact, Alameda County sales tax revenues have dropped by about a third as a result of the recession, and that has spillover effects. If you're giving 10% of your money to, tra to paratransit and your money is down by a third, that translates into service cuts, into higher fares, into what you've seen on AC Transit, on the mass transit side, service cuts and fare increases, which then translates into paratransit service cuts and fare increases. I said we had a unique opportunity. 
the Alameda CTC is in the process of deciding whether to extend and augment the current Measure B, add another uh, either quarter cent or half cent to that tax, extend it out beyond 2022 to restore the cuts, and perhaps give a little bit extra to transit, paratransit, and other transportation needs. That decision is being made right now, and I'd like to encourage all of you to become involved. Uh, there will be a series of public workshops that will be held in the month of October and the very first part of November throughout Alameda County. And you have a representative sitting in the front row who comes to all of our community uh, uh, working group meetings and you should be, become involved yourself. Um, I'm sure the league will be asked at some point to make an endorsement of, of a measure that we're hoping to be on the ballot in 2012. So that's my commercial for the measure, uh, but it is also by way of saying that we make local decisions about how to spend our local money. Measure B and the local sales tax, its counterpart in Contra Costa County, is the one source of funding that can't be touched by the governor, can't be taken away by anyone else, allows us to make our own local decisions. But all of these funding programs are oversubscribed. The recession has an impact on not just on your personal budget, but obviously on the budgets of all the public agencies that fund services. And we have been, at the same time that we are seeing the senior population begin to really escalate, we are seeing revenues decline from virtually every funding source. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I feel that funding will be the biggest challenge that we face uh, as we're looking at population needs increasing. I've been given the hook. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we do have a person with a topic. Um, Betty, would you like to add anything to that or elaborate? Or? I'll, just, I'll just say one minute. I think there's some tremendous opportunities uh, for uh, all of us to work together, not just for seniors, but for the whole population, to make sure that there's good transit service for everybody. Uh, starting with our kids, where there's opportunities to have uh, school passes for children that are being debated right now. And uh, the research we've been doing at the university makes it pretty clear that if you put a transit pass in the hands of a high school student or a college student, you help develop habits that last. We've been doing surveys of people who are regular transit riders in Alameda County in Oakland and Berkeley, and one of the things that we're finding is that those people who never had parents who rode transit, didn't really do it when they were little kids, but they got a, a pass either in high school or in college, decided that was actually an okay way to get around, and they became users of the transit system uh, as adults. So, so that's a good thing to do. So I think there are partnerships we can find that put uh, youth and seniors together uh, working for something that will really generate a public good for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And now, Shannon, I will tell us a little about Transformation for America. I'm very interested. In Thank I you. Don't know a thing about. Yeah, so um, Mim really well explained Transform, which is the organization I work for here locally. We work for wall class transit and walkable communities in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, and I am the staff person that's working on the most beyond of all and working on the federal transportation bill. Um, and so Transform is one of over 500 partners nationwide, um, along with Nelson Nygaard um, and other businesses, community organizations, elected officials, who are part of the Transportation for America campaign. Um, and over the summer, we released a report which was called Aging in Place, Stuck Without Options. Um, I apologize, I only brought 10 copies of the executive summary because we had a little printer snafu this morning, um, but we also don't have them laying around because they're available electronically, so if you'd like a copy and you don't get one, um, I'd be glad to send those on afterwards. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about this report, uh, which looks at what's happening specifically at the people who are becoming seniors, at the baby boom generation, um, who this year, the first baby boomers, boomers are turning 65, um, and that silver tsunami um, will continue until 2030 when the last baby boomers turn 65. 
Um, and so it's an unprecedented increase in our senior population um, and the impacts to not only the seniors but also our communities as a whole is pretty significant uh, based on whether or not those folks have access to transportation. Um, uh, we know that studies done by AARP show that seniors age 65 and older who no longer drive make 15% fewer trips to the doctor, 59% fewer trips to shop or eat out, um, and 65% fewer trips to visit friends and family. Um, and so when we're looking at health outcomes, both, all of those things together um, really influence the health of individuals, whether you're connected to your social network, whether you're able to get to health care services that you need, um, whether you're able to get to the grocery store and buy healthy food. Those are very important pieces of, um, of you know, just having a continuing to have a meaningful life and also continuing to have a healthy life. And those are things that we should be paying attention to when we're looking at our transportation system. Um, and so um, one of the things that we did in this report was to look at where do seniors live now? Um, where do the next seniors, where, where do the baby boomer, boomers live who are entering this senior category? Um, and where is there good access to transit? And so um, attached to the executive summary, um, there are a couple of maps that um, are also available on our website of different uh, metro areas and um, categorizing geographically where is there good transit access and where are there are a lot of seniors. Um, and so I printed out the maps for San Francisco um, and the peninsula in Marin as well as for the East Bay. Um, and, and I will tell you that you know our national reports Look, looking to influence Congress often are making the case where the Bay Area is way better off than Atlanta and Oklahoma and lots of other places that you know don't have as much transit to begin with. Um, and so our national rankings, I think, show that we're in a really good spot um, here in the Bay Area. At the same time, um, we are still looking at significant percentages of um, seniors that will have poor access to public transit in the future. Um, in the Oakland, on the Oakland side of the bay here, 18% of seniors are projected to have poor access to public transit. Um, and on the San Francisco side, um, it's more like 12%. Um, what I think stands out from, from these maps, um, the yellow areas, and I'm sorry this is hard to see, and so, um, I hope that you'll grab a handout um, or look at this online. Um, the yellow areas are the places where there's poor access, but not a lot of seniors. And when we look forward um, 15 years, what we see, or actually only four years to 2015, I apologize, um, what we see is that those yellow areas turn red. And that's not because transit access changes, but because we have increased numbers of seniors. So. The last thing that I want to add is that this assumes that our transit service stays the same. Um, and of course, decisions being made now at the regional, state, and, and federal level are impacting whether or not we continue to have the same level, affordability, um, et cetera, of, of transit service. So these maps may not even be accurate. They may paint a more optimistic picture, depending on the public policy decisions we make about funding this year and in years to come. That's my summary. I'm glad to answer questions as we move along. I, uh, could you give us the website so that we can find this as you, since we'll all read it? Absolutely. Um, our website is www.letter T, number four, America.org, um, and you'll find a link to the Aging in Place Stuck Without Options um, report right on the front page of that. Okay, we'll, we'll um, if, is, is anybody um, wanting to write a question, if so, raise your hand and, and Polly will bring you something to write about. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I have a question for Polly. Uh, how do you see senior transportation needs as different from those uh, of the general population and um, do you think that these needs call for special segregated kinds of transportation like paratransit or um, could tra regular transit, do you think, be designed to serve the needs? And who would like to start? Okay. <clears throat> 
I think we do ourselves a tremendous disservice when we start thinking about seniors in a monolithic way. When we talk about the senior tsunami, what we're really talking about are baby boomers who are going to become seniors. We redefined what it meant to be teenagers. We redefined what it meant to be uh, young families, and we will redefine what it means to be a, a senior, particularly a young senior. Uh, and I say that as someone who is married to a young senior, who when he retired a couple of years ago decided that what he would do so that he wouldn't spend a lot of time on the couch was uh, any trip that he made that was a mile or less he would walk. If it was five miles or less he would take his bike and only if it was longer than five miles would he consider moving the car. And after a year of retirement, he lost 30 pounds, is in the best shape he's ever been. And, and, you know, and so if you say, well, seniors need paratransit, you're making a big mistake. You are grossly overgeneralizing. Seniors like universal design for our buildings. We need universal design for access for people of all ages and all levels of ability. That has an economic impact as well, because we know that while a trip on AC Transit on their regular system is subsidized by somewhere around a buck and a half, two bucks a trip, a trip on AC Transit's paratransit system is subsidized by about $35 a trip. And Mallory will know the exact number, but let's... About $35 a trip. So with that in mind, every trip that we can help be made by walking, biking, and regular transit is a, is, represents real savings to our public transit, to our, to our public funding agencies, and to our own public health, is what I would say. I started out talking to you about building coalitions with young people. Uh, and I absolutely agree that we can't really talk about seniors as a special group that, that's apart from the rest of the population. Uh, most seniors want to be integrated with the population, not separated from the population. Now, that doesn't mean that some people don't need paratransit. Of course, some people do need it, and it's critically important that they have it. But we basically need good walking facilities, good biking facilities, safe driving facilities for people who drive, because a lot of us will continue to drive well into our 80s. Uh, and really good transit, and we need to have all of those things. And we aren't doing a very good job in any of them in the Bay Area or elsewhere in the United States right now. We have a very unsafe highway system. We uh, are not anywhere near competitive with countries like Sweden or Denmark in the number of people who are killed or injured on our highway system. We don't have transit in vast areas of the Bay Area, which is one of the best places in the country for transit. No transit at all. There's not a choice because there is no transit in many communities. We build a densities, and this is a touchy one for a lot of people, we build a densities where no transit agency can afford to operate transit. And if we continue to build in very low density, single family homes sprawled across the countryside, it's really hard for any transit agency to ever provide that, no matter what the subsidy, because at some point you get to the point where running a bus is not a good choice from an environmental perspective. Uh, you'd be better off driving your car because a bus that doesn't carry very many people is not a good environmental vehicle. So we have to think about community building. And uh, this is not news to those of us who work in this field. We know we have to do it, but what we really don't have is the political will yet to do these things. And here's where I think the League of Women Voters has been so important to us and so influential because you do your research. You come up with smart ideas based on real facts and then you get out there and you organize and make sure that these things happen. And that's, uh, that's an admirable trait and something that's really important for all of us that, that the League has been doing this for years. And we're counting on you to keep doing that. Okay. I think the only thing that I would add is to underscore that, that the needs that are, that there are overlapping groups of populations that, you know, seniors may or may not be people who need to take longer to cross the street. It sounds like your husband does not. Um, uh, seniors may or may not be people who are low income, but there's a, a large overlap there um, as people retire and move to a fixed income. And so um, as we're looking to create a transportation system that works for everyone, uh, we need to be aware of the different overlapping populations 
Um, and, and so complete streets is one of the policies that we've recommended out of this, um, out of this report to ensure that there are safe ways to get to transit, um, as well as having um, the kind of transit facilities that make it easy for someone to quickly and safely board a bus um, by having you know, more level boarding options. Um, and, and to ensure that we're investing in transit so that, um, so that fares remain affordable um, for everyone, people of all ages who are low income, but particularly for seniors in this, in this focus. Um, and, and so that we you know, are investing in transit to ensure that we continue to have service going to the places where we need it um, and don't continue to see the, um, the service cuts that we have been. The, um, House proposal for transportation that was put out this summer recommended a 34% cut um, across the board, but 34% cut from transit is extremely detrimental, <laughs> um, is devastating at this point when we're already looking at um, fare box revenue and, um, and local revenue options um, being lower because of the recession. Um, and so paying attention to those overlaps are ways that we can ensure that we're making the right decisions to help our, our aging population, but also that are going to really help our entire community. Um, I have a question or two from the audience that I'll ask. Um, how can all the organizations such as Senior Center, CIL, CEI, UC Berkeley, Alta Bay, City of Berkeley, et cetera, uh, unite to combine resources to provide better service that's more efficient, more effective, easier, more accessible to all of us. There's a long question. <laughs> Good question. Well, and if there was a 64 bazillion dollar question, that's probably it. Uh, and the Alameda CTC that I mentioned earlier has been working across lines with public and private agencies, nonprofits, trying to get better coordination of services. This is going to be uh, incredibly important as we are trying, all of us are trying to slice a much smaller resource pie in order to provide the best services possible. For example, a senior center that has a van that they use for um, taking field trips has a van that might not be being utilized during certain hours of the day when people could otherwise use it. Uh, some of the limitations that make that difficult include things like insurance, uh, operating dollars, maintenance dollars, but there are some very innovative programs that are looking at ways to do this. A San Mateo County is looking at a vehicle sharing program that will allow various nonprofits and public agencies to share a pool of vehicles when they need it, and they have been able to overcome that insurance hurdle. But they're, you know, these are very um, hard-fought victories, and that's just slowly coming to the Bay Area. What we need is, in a time of economic limitations, people want to hold on to their piece of the pie harder than they ever have before, and we need people to think of ways to um, work together to stretch those dollars. It's a, it's a tricky question without an obvious answer, but one that's being worked on. And Betty, you may have some other good examples. I think good examples is really where I would start uh, because, <laughs> because we, we learn by looking at each other's best practices and then borrowing uh, freely from, from those best practices. And one of the things we like to do at the university is try to document those, those best practices so we really have a compendium of ideas that uh, we can share with each other and, and uh, borrow from so that we can all uh, get up to speed faster and learn better. Uh, networking turns out to be the fastest way that people learn. We've been doing some research on how ideas, good ideas spread. And creating networks is the way that they really spread quickly. It's, it's a, a way to, to speed up learning immensely. So making connections with other leagues, making connections with other groups and what best ideas they have and sharing those ideas will speed everybody up and everybody will get more ideas really quickly that way. Uh, finally, collecting some of your own data and then sharing it with, with people. Uh, you'd be surprised how many graduate students I have that are looking for a professional report to do. And a professional report's a requirement for every one of our master's students. They have to write one. Public policy has the same thing in their program. They have to write a report. The students are out there looking for things to do. 
uh, they would just love to have data on seniors' travel and what some of those needs are and to be able to study that. Um, so propose to the universities, not just to Berkeley, but to other universities, that you've got uh, a data source and a willing partner and ask the student to come in and help out and then they'll go work for Bonnie when they're done, maybe, <laughs> and continue yeah. those, those good practices, or for talc. Okay. Um, can I? Can I add oh yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to underscore that networks um, are 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 critical, and that's why we are part of the Transportation for America Coalition, not only to influence what the funding decisions are going to be in Congress, um, but also to strengthen our networks here locally so that when those decisions make are made here, that we are a better force to be reckoned with. Um, I will say that um, to to pay some homage to a colleague of mine at Transform, Paul Ramos, who has been working on the bus rapid transit project in East Oakland, um, that making data accessible about where people need to go and where people need to get to um, is, is one of the key ways that we can work together, um, as well as getting more people to be part of the process. So um, Howell worked with United Seniors of Oakland and Alameda County, with Allen Temple, with AC Transit, um, to ensure that seniors on the International Boulevard Corridor were part of the planning process for the Bus Rabbit Transit Program um, as that is moving forward. Um, and they actually added three stops in Oakland due to the input of seniors um, in that planning process. Um, they proposed BRT stations and moved some of them um, in order to make sure that they were close to destinations um, that were important to the senior population in those neighborhoods. Um, and so by you know, surveying and making sure that that data was available, available about what the needs were, um, and then ensuring that um, the people who are gonna be impacted were at the table when the decisions were being made, those pieces are really clear ways that when you list a whole bunch of you know, important community organizations, um, that, that those are the folks that really need to be involved in making these decisions. Um, and that's, I think, one of the clear ways that, that we can work together um, on, on specific projects as well as on bigger policies. Well, I hope all the league members here are taking good notes because yeah. I think we're getting some very good ideas about potential projects. I want to say to the audience that we have some good questions here. And some I'm saving for the second panel because they really have to do with operations, they're not being ignored. Um, I would like to get a little bit uh, into the discussion of funding, and you have said that a little. So this one leads us there a bit. Uh, with the demise of redevelopment agencies as a main source for affordable housing finances, do you see continued partnerships between transit and development of all uh, all forms of housing. In other words, is there any ongoing work that you see going on? Or yeah, this is one of the key things that the region is discussing right now. Um, the linkages between land use and transit, as Betty mentioned in her opening remarks, the importance of building at a certain density in order to attract and make it possible for people to have easy access to transit is a tremendous concern to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC, and ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments. They're working together in a program called One Bay Area, go to onebayarea.com, to see their um, take on land use planning and transportation. But to answer the specific question, there are funds available for transit-oriented <laughs> development at uh, development at reasonable densities for all income levels near transit stations. In Oakland Fruitvale, the development at the Fruitvale BART station is a good example of a, a, a partnership that included the use <laughs> of some of those funds in order to build some um, dense housing at uh, a, a range of income levels at, good, at walking distance to BART and AC Transit. The death of redevelopment is indeed the loss of an important tool that cities and counties have used to fund affordable housing, but cities and counties in the Bay Area are pretty smart about finding alternatives to redevelopment. I'm working with the city of San Francisco on a couple of major base reuse projects where they've um, substituted an alternative 
to the redevelopment district in order to be able to capture the value, uh, the increased value of that land as it's developed. And in the Bay Area, there's pretty sophisticated folks here who will find ways to find alternatives, and we have some public funding available for those projects. So I think that is going to continue and, and continue to grow over time. Thank you. Uh, did you want to say something about this? Okay. Uh, one thing where I think we really need some help is in getting policies aligned so they're not uh, canceling each other out. <laughs> and we do a lot of this in California and at the federal level where uh, we, we earmark funds only for highways when, in fact, when you look at what people want, they'd like sidewalk improvements so you can actually walk to the bus stop without tripping over a broken sidewalk so that you can have better bus service, so that you can pay for operations instead of just building more capital projects and then not having money to operate them. Uh, so we've had a lot of policies that maybe made sense at one point, maybe made sense 30 years ago, but they're still on the books. They're now uh, working across purposes, the things we want to do, and it's time for us to really insist that our leaders start working to harmonize the policies so we're all going, pulling in the same direction instead of working against each other, and that's a, a big area where I think this would be important. There were some problems re with redevelopment, some abuses of redevelopment. We kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater as a result of it in, in times of exigent finances. Uh, we ought to reconsider what we're doing, I think, on that one, just as an example. Uh, we really ought to be doing a lot more to make sure that we can spend our tax dollars on things like sidewalk improvements, because you can't get to transit if you can't walk to transit for the most part. Uh, we really ought to make sure that we aren't increasing speeds on roads that are unsafe for pedestrians. There are lots of, of roads in California where uh, the speed limit is too high to be safe for pedestrians. It's one of the reasons we have such a high death rate in the U.S. compared to our European counterparts. Our speeds are too high in many urban areas for safe walking. So there are lots of other things that just seem like small things, but we have rules and policies that get in our way and keep us from doing the right thing. And here's something where I think we ought to insist that we fix this. Thank you. I really appreciate what Betty just said about um, aligning our policies and aligning the flows of funding. Um, one of the main policies that we are pushing for um, at the federal level is a strategic transportation planning policy. Um, so the um, One Bay Area program that um, MTC is working on um, is you know, a, a great example of what we think every metro region in, in the nation should be doing and that that kind of planning um, that says what are our goals, what kinds of transportation do we need to meet those goals, um, that those plans are determined locally so that we know, because we know locally where we need to put those sidewalk improvements and where we need to um, you know, put a new bus route. Um, what we'd like to see is that those plans inform where the federal money flows to, um, as opposed to us doing a plan that says we need to invest in sidewalks and then getting a check for highways. Um, so those are the kinds of policies that we're pushing nationally um, to ensure not only that we're doing smart planning, which is something that in the Bay Area isn't as scary sounding as it might sound to folks you know, in other parts of the country, um, but also really talking about accountability. Um, and in a time where we have scarcity or perceived scarcity um, in terms of our dollars, um, how are we targeting those dollars to the things that are most needed in communities on the ground? Um, and I think that there's a lot of support for accountability and a lot of support for um, maximizing the bang for the buck. Um, we think that strategic planning is really the best way to actually do that. Um, and we're fortunate to be in, in a region that's, that's piling that and really setting some of the models for the nation on, on those kinds of strategies. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, this is a good question for this panel, I think. Um, in Southern Alameda County, we have a large senior population that does not speak English. What outreach methods are used for this unique population and their transportation needs? Anybody else that one? That's something I know something about. Um, that is absolutely true, and it is something that those of us in the northern part of the county went um, find, at least I personally, because I do a lot of work there, find shocking every time I go there. Um, 
the most language diverse part of Alameda County is actually Southern Alameda County in the Fremont, Newark, Union City area where the diversity of particularly Asian languages is phenomenal. And one of the things that we have found as the cities there have been developing their um, programs and outreach for, for transit and paratransit is the need for um, reaching people through their communities. Having the Afghani community, for example, be a partner in doing outreach and education to the Afghani community. Having um, institutions that people trust be their touchstone and their way to enter uh, for to get services and to learn services of all kinds. In South County, the city of Fremont has been spearheading uh, travel training for seniors, teaching people how to use <coughs> the transit system. And the trainers have been, been recruited from these language minority communities so that there's an Afghani trainer and there's an Urdu trainer and there are trainers in these languages that can teach people how to access and use the system. That is critical to getting people for whom Engl English is not a first language on the system. And the city of Fremont, I don't know if we have anyone here from the city of Fremont, has done a phenomenal job in leading South County uh, and helping people learn how to use the um, services that are available to them. When I talked to Hoel about um, what he had done with the, what he had worked with AC Transit on with the bus rapid transit, and I asked him what's next, um, that's exactly what he said was, you know, really parsing then the senior population and getting into, you know, how do we reach out to Vietnamese speaking seniors um, and other language groups um, within the senior population because the needs are different and, um, and if you don't speak English, you know, we don't have universally um, available resources for you. Um, we had an intern who we now gobbled up and have on staff um, who translated into Vietnamese um, some of the outreach materials and we um, helped to translate into Spanish some of the outreach materials for the bus rapid transit um, in East Oakland and our hope is that we can continue to work with AC Transit to integrate multiple languages into that project as it moves forward um, but also that that can be a model for further planning processes and become a you know an expected piece of our toolkit um, in public planning especially in a place that's as, um, as diverse as the Bay Area okay um, do you wish to weigh in no I think I think that's you it think it's nice. covered okay um, we have just a few minutes um, this is an interesting question who decides and who should decide the cutoff point for transit subsidies, but I want to know, you know, is there a universal cutoff point? <laughs> well, one of the things I think it's really important to realize is that transit is not the only mode of transportation that is subsidized. And in fact, the most heavily subsidized mode of transportation is actually driving. Because our roads and all of our roadway infrastructure is heavily subsidized by taxpayers. We Per, we, all, we think of transit as being heavily subsidized. It is, it is in fact subsidized, but all of our modes of transportation are. When you ask who decides and how do we decide what the cutoff is for that, um, I think it, it, is, uh, it, it, is, it is and probably ought to be voters who make that decision, uh, since it is voters that decide on, on how tax dollars should be allocated. Um, and, you know, is there a limit? Is there a universal limit? No. Um, if you look at the Bay Area transit systems, the subsidy provider is low compared to many other cities. Uh, and, in fact, the um, amount of subsidy, the amount of tax support that's been available to public transit systems has been reduced at all of the levels in which they receive subsidy, whether that is federal operating assistance, state operating assistance, local money that's generated through sales tax, all of these sources have declined in the past several years, just at the time when more riders are trying to access the system. And we find ourselves in what feels like an unending spiral of service cuts, fare increases, and then ridership reduction 
as people find it more difficult to access just at the time when we ought to be adding that as something as an affordable option to people. So I don't have a good answer of where the cutoff is, but I do think it's important to recognize that all of our modes of transportation, from flying in airplanes to um, driving our cars, are in fact subsidized as part of the infrastructure of this country. There are some other considerations you want to take into account. Uh, lifeline services are really important, and we may not want to talk about having uh, any kind of uh, fare for those kinds of services. People really need to get someplace, maybe we need to, to get them to those places. Uh, is this not coming through? Okay. Um, so that's a big issue, is, is that there are some people who absolutely don't have any other means of travel and providing service to those people it can cost a lot of money and we often say that's important to us socially, so we provide that. Secondly, there are environmental considerations. If you're running a big AC transit bus around with no passengers on it, it's not a good environmental choice. You want to fill those seats. So we want to think about how much service you provide, and that's partly an operations question, so I won't go too much into that, but you want to think about how much service you can provide to keep the seats reasonably full so it will look like a good environmental choice. And that's important if you're worried about air pollution, it's important if you're worried about uh, dependence on foreign oil, and it's important if you're worried about carbon uh, emissions into the atmosphere. So some important environmental considerations and thinking about making good investments that will be well utilized so that they will be environmentally sound. And of course, they won't require as much subsidy either if you do that. So that's, that's a second way to think about it. Uh, in terms of the subsidy, just to put some hard numbers in what Bonnie says, the best available data that we have at the University of California on the average cost per mile subsidy for the automobile is 50 cents a mile. Oh. Okay, and that's because we don't charge people the damage that their air pollution does. We don't charge them, uh, or we, we pay out of a different pocket for the military defense of the oil supplies, um, etc. So uh, we aren't paying for all the costs that we're imposing when we drive our vehicles. The other biggest choice that we've made publicly is to require parking facilities and then often to require that they be provided free of charge. So even in the suburbs where land is relatively cheap, pretty hard to provide a parking space that at a market rate would be less than $1,000 a year. And it costs money to maintain it, so probably $100 a month would be kind of the minimum cost in this region that we could provide a surface park, not talking about a garage, surface parking space. You get into Berkeley, we're talking about fifty or $60,000 per parking space in a structure. fifty to $60,000. If we're going to do that at market rate, we would expect to charge $6,000 approximately to provide that space. Okay, $500 a month would be your bill if you're paying the actual market rate for that parking space. Nobody pays that. It means you're subsidizing it every other possible way. You go and buy a shirt, you're subsidizing your parking space through the sales tax or through some other kind of, of tax that you're paying. It's all being hidden from us and what it's really costing us. That's not good policy when we hide costs so we don't really realize what our choices are. And so that's one of those kinds of things where if we start thinking more seriously about what the real costs are, we probably wouldn't make the same decisions we're making. And we probably have a better transportation system and a cleaner environment and a healthier public. <laughs> well, Betty did a great job of redefining the subsidy, which was my first point. And, and mentioned health at the end, which I think was the other category that I wanted to make sure that got in there of um, what are the costs that we're not, we're not counting in, um, in our subsidy when we're looking just at the gas tax. Um, I also just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think one of the other reasons that we're really advocating for strategic planning policies federally is to ensure that we're not just looking at each mode of transportation individually, but really looking at the whole. Um, and I think this is an audience that I can say the word social contract in front of and not um, get in trouble. But really, if, if, we're, if we're looking at our country and our communities as places that we want to succeed for all of us, um, then, then we need to be looking big picture at how do we um, create communities and create transportation systems, healthcare systems, whatever systems we're going to work with at a government level, at a public level. How do we do that in ways that make the most sense across our population, across our communities, um, and then invest 
to achieve those goals versus parsing it out into, well, what does it cost for this one thing? What does it cost for this other thing? Um, and, and looking at it piecemeal. And I think that we get better results um, when we take a step back and look at the big picture um, and set goals and try to hold ourselves accountable to them um, through our investments and through our choices that way um, than by you know looking at, well, is this, is this one thing that's connected to this one revenue source, is that the best way to do it? Um, so I think a holistic approach is really one of the things that we're looking for because it is a transportation system. Um, and we want it to work that way. And then the last thing is just that in terms of who decides, I think that one of the trends that we are seeing is more um, interest and, 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 and more success at having the voters decide and at increasingly local levels, um, which is kind of the opposite of what I just said, um, because we are kind of seeing our, our national identity, um, you know, our national uh, commitment I think, <coughs> challenged. Um, in, in a political way right now. Um, but when we look at things like Measure B, that we really do have an opportunity to do best for our community. And that doesn't mean that what happens in DC doesn't impact us or isn't important or is hopeless, because I wouldn't be doing my job <coughs> if I thought it was entirely hopeless. Um, but that as we move to greater and greater uh, accountability and, and commitment at the local level, that that's where we really need to be paying attention um, and where we have a lot of opportunity to make those decisions for our communities um, and where we have a lot of you know, dynamic opportunities to do them in the ways that are right for our location. Thank you, and I want to say, it's, it's probably time to let you all go, but we are so blessed to have had you today. Oh. This is really a distinguished panel of transportation people. These are the rock stars of our transportation <laughs> policy world. <laughs> and, and thank you.